essential. So enjoy today. We have a few <laughs> housekeeping issues, which are very important because we are going live in two minutes, and this will be broadcast globally. And we have a few issues, which is don't cross the cameras. You will then be interrupting the live stream, so be careful of that. If possible, please stay in your seats. The bathroom is here, which really doesn't work. So we ask that you leave through the back exit only, and then people will guide you to a bathroom on another floor if you need to use one. And then lastly, no flash cameras. Obviously, that will disturb the live stream, and then you all know from the sign that we are filming. So welcome and enjoy. Hi. <clears throat> Hi. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, and I want to extend a special thanks to ABC Carpet and Home for hosting us here today. I'm Joey Bergstein. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at 7th Generation. And I'm really pleased to be here today with our very distinguished panel that is uh, behind us. Uh, we're here to engage in a really interesting conversation about toxins, the presence of toxins in our life, and what we can do about that. And we're really privileged to have a really great group of people to speak with us. We have a conversation hosted by Sarah Snow. Many of you will know her. She's got a great television program, Get Fresh with Sarah Snow. We've got John Replical, the CEO of Seventh Generation, Jeannie Rizzo of the Breast Cancer Fund, as well as Deepak Chopra, of course. Uh, before we get into the details of the discussion, I wanted to spend a couple of minutes just talking a little bit first about Seventh Generation and what we stand for, as well as introduce some of the learnings that we've seen in the study. So seventh generation for nearly 25 years, we're celebrating our 25th anniversary next year, has really been at the leading edge of trying to drive change through business. We fundamentally believe that the best way to have an impact on society, on our collective health, is through business and through our business practices. And this great company has been making absolutely outstanding personal care products, household products, products that work as well, of any, as, well as any of the conventional brands, yet are derived from natural sources and, in fact, are much better for you, for your family, and for the world around us. For a company the size of seventh generation, we've really had an impact that goes well beyond the size of this company. We've been leading uh, a successful ban to get phosphates out of auto dish products. We were the first company to be fully labeling all of the ingredients in our products right from the get-go's because we have a fundamental belief that the consumer has an absolute right to know what goes into the products that they're using for themselves as well as for their families. Uh, and importantly, we've been at the forefront also of advocating for change for the Toxic Chemical Act, uh, which was established in 1978. That's right, nearly 34 years ago, that was the last time that that act has been updated, despite the fact that there have been thousands and thousands and thousands of new chemicals that have been composed with unknown toxicity over the whole course of that time. And frankly, that's why we're here today. We're here today to talk about that. We're clear on where we stand, but we wanted to understand where the American consumers stand as well. We wanted to understand what they think about toxic chemicals in their life, about the impact of those chemicals in their life. In particular, we were really interested in what they had to say about petrochemicals. Now, we thought you, know, you wouldn't want to bathe in crude oil, so why would you want them in your body lotions or in your body wash or, frankly, in your laundry care products? But that's what we believe. We wanted to see if consumers shared that as well. So we commissioned a study where we spoke to 1,000 consumers, representative of the U.S. Uh, census data, and we learned a lot of really interesting things. We were asking specifically questions about their level of understanding of these ingredients and their level of concern about these ingredients in their products. And what we heard back was really interesting. We heard that over two-thirds of consumers, or nearly two-thirds, excuse me, of consumers are concerned about harmful chemicals in the products that they use every day, in their personal care products, in their laundry products, in their baby care products. We heard that nearly two-thirds of consumers are specifically concerned around petrochemicals in their products. And we heard that the level of concern was specifically around the long-term impact on their health and on their family's health. So really interesting studies. And if you take a step back and you think about it, when was the last time you can remember that two out of three Americans agreed on anything? I say that as a Canadian, <laughs> but the question still goes. Uh, so really, really interesting 
interesting learning. So we take that as an absolute mandate for change. We really believe, fully believe, that it is absolutely critical that all companies fully disclose the products that are going onto, onto their, into their products. The consumer has an absolute right to know about that. In fact, we went further, and this is where the bio-based program comes into place. About a year ago, the USDA, the Department for Agriculture, launched a bio-based seal. It's a voluntary program where uh, companies are able to disclose the level of uh, natural products that are going into the products that are being um, the products that they're that they're being produced, and we wanted to understand if consumers were aware at all of this program. In fact, we also wanted to understand the level of awareness of petrochemicals in the products that people are using. And what we found is that only about half of consumers, when exposed to a list of ingredients, had any idea at all that these products contained petrochemicals. And then when we told them that they contained petrochemicals. Uh, more than half of those consumers were very concerned and wanted to have some level of labeling that told them about what was in the products. So that's why we're here today. We really deeply believe that the bio-based program that the USDA has launched is really important, a critical step to telling consumers what they need to know about the products that are going into the things that they buy, the things that they use for their family, and the things that they're using every single day. Um, and in fact, what we're also proud to say is that Seventh Generation is the first company to roll this out on consumer-facing uh, consumer products. We're starting with our, uh, our program of personal care products. You've seen some outside. Those will be launching into stores over the next few weeks. And over the coming months, we're rolling that out across our entire range. Again, wanting to make sure that consumers know what's inside of the products that they use. So. I don't want to share any more data with you. There's lots of data. There's a, a handy infographic that, uh, that you'll see you can walk away with. You can walk away with some more data on, uh, you know, in the data packages as you're going. I want to move into the, to the panel discussion. I will let you know that we are live streaming the event today, and we will be taking questions in the last 15 minutes of the discussion. So if you have questions in the room, you can come up to the mic that's going to be in the middle of the room. Or for the people who are watching via live stream, you'll be able to feed in your questions through the live stream. So with no further ado, I want to thank you again for joining us, and I want to pass over to Sarah. Thank you, Billy. Thank you so much. Um, I am Sarah Snow, and I'd like to introduce the rest of our panel to you. First, we have John Repliga. He, he was a former uh, executive at Unilever, former CEO of Burt's Bees. He's been with Seventh Generation for a, while, a short while now. And he's also, he brings an expansive and a very unique approach to this topic because of his his vast um, array of experience. Next, please welcome Jeannie Rizzo. Jeannie is the CEO of the Breast Cancer Fund. Uh, Jeannie is the driving force behind the Campaign for Safe Cosmetics, which many of you are probably familiar with. She'll share with us the science behind some of these concerns and also the very real experience with the health risks that they represent. And then finally, we have Deepak Chopra. I'm very honored to be sitting next to Deepak today. Um, in fact, this stage here is affectionately known as Deepak's home base. So we're very happy to be here today. Um, thank you for hosting us also here. Um, you all probably know Deepak Chopra. Um, he's an expert in natural healing. But what you may not know is that Deepak is also known as an MD. Um, he has taught at Tufts University, Boston University, and Harvard University, and he's a former chief of staff at the New England Memorial Hospital in Massachusetts. Uh, so we look forward to hearing from Deepak also, especially, um, specifically, how exposures to these toxins may be undermining our individual well-being. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, John, if I can direct the first question to you. What, what is this study, which we just heard Joey sort of summarize for us, what is this study telling us? Well, good morning. Good morning to everyone. Morning. And uh, before I answer the question directly, I just wanted to specifically call out and welcome and thank Jeffrey Hollander and Sheila Hollander. Jeffrey's our founder. <laughs> Jeffrey's the founder of Seventh Generation. Sheila's our women's health advocate. And I have to say it's their vision, uh, their courage, uh, that has led us as uh, an industry leader forward. And it's because of them that I'm able to be here today. So thank you to both of you. Um, to your question on the study, I think the study is crystal clear. Uh, and that is simply put, it's time for a change. Uh, we, all of us, 
have a very clear mandate to think differently about human health uh, and take responsibility <coughs> to move that agenda forward when two-thirds of consumers of the American public are concerned about their human health. It is very clear we need to act and behave differently. We need to come together, uh, industry, government, non-governmental, medical, all of us working together to find better solutions to safeguard human health and well-being and being responsible in terms of how we think about this interconnected system that we live in. Great, and, and I know as we go along, we'll get more into what those solutions are, how we can actually do that, and how we can uh, respond to the results from this study. Uh, Deepak, if I can uh, direct the next question to you. More than a decade ago, you wrote Perfect Health. And this was a book, it was one of the first practical guides to harnessing the healing power of the mind. And in that book, you introduced a lot of people to the medical system known as Ayurveda. Um, Ayurveda tells us that freedom from sickness depends on contacting our own awareness, bringing it into balance, and then extending that balance to the body. Why is that balance so important? Well, all biological organisms, not just the human biology, biological organisms, have what is called a dynamic state of non-change, which we call homeostasis. It's our fundamental state. So when you injure yourself, um, the body goes into a response to heal itself. Uh, when you have an infection, the body responds by making antibodies and so on. And petrochemicals are literally agents of war. They're related to things like Agent Orange which is meant to create violence in the ecosystem. And your body is an ecosystem. It's, it's a recycling ecosystem. And you're introducing inflammation in the body when you use these. And um, inflammation now, we know, actually, is the underlying factor in many ca cancers, in many autoimmune illnesses, in those who are susceptible to infection and degenerative disorders. There's not a single um, illness that doesn't have inflammation as a background. And we're introducing literally an in inflammation into the body, an inflamed body and inflamed mind. They go together too, by the way. Mm -hmm. And so when we introduce these agents in our bodies, and whether they're through our skin, which is the same germ layer that gives rise to our gut and our brain, by the way, mm -hmm. is called the neuroectoderm, you're basically creating war on the body. And you're also destroying the ecosystem because we are recycling with the ecosystem, the web of life that nurtures us. It's really frightening to hear it described that way, that they are actually, petrochemicals are actually agents of war. And violence, yes, huge. And violence. Jeannie, let me turn to you now. The study shows that the long-term health effects and absorption through the skin were top concerns, two of the top concerns um, of people. Um, let's talk a little bit more about petrochemicals and why are they such a concern? Well, I think you heard a, a bit already. Petrochemicals come from petroleum and half, uh, more than half of every gallon of petroleum that's produced is not used to make gasoline. The other half is used and, you know, the, the, when scientists came up with this idea that they could synthesize them into other things, they were not knowing, and there was no mandate for them to know what they were making and what the impact of that would be on health and the environment long term. So when Joey said there were 84,000 synthetic chemicals in commerce, 62,000 of those were grandfathered in in 1976. So these petrochemicals are are used. They, you know, they're degreasers for gear. They can take the paint off your your garage floor. And those same chemicals are synthesized into and formulated into products that are used to clean with, to make lipstick stay on, to make lotion softer. And, you've got, and what they do, the characteristic that they have, that most of them have, is that they disrupt the hormonal system. That they actually trick your body into believing it's been exposed to a hormone. So it reacts that same way. And the body isn't prepared to react to that, to that many external hormones. So in the case of, when we look at it from the breast cancer standpoint, you have 
women who are pregnant, babies, young girls. We're seeing girls go into puberty earlier and earlier. I don't need to give you a scientific study for you to know that. That's really obvious. And what's happening is that we're provoking the, the lowering of the age of puberty, which has an impact on later life breast cancer. Mm -hmm. So the, the more cycles a, a girl is exposed to hormones, including hormones from the outside. So our concern with petrochemicals are that it is multiple doses over and over, day after day, with 20 or 30 products a day that we use, and that the impact is, as Deepak said, obviously the inflammatory process is provoked, the hormone system is disrupted, and our body is doing all it can to respond. And, and our breasts wind up being the toxic dump site of these chemicals. So it's, it's, it's a, a very disturbing to, to be thinking about how we use petrochemicals at will. And it's, it's repeated exposure because it's not just in one or two of the products we use. It's in so many of the products that we use directly on our body or that we come into contact with. Jeannie, I'm going to ask you to repeat something that you said sort of at the beginning of your answer because I think that even as well-educated of an audience as we have today, I think it's still alarming to people to hear this, that when we mine for oil, not all of it is being used for gasoline. And, and repeat that, the, the percentages. About, uh, I think it's 47% is used for gasoline, somewhere around half of all oil. That's how petroleum vaseline jelly was discovered, mm -hmm. out of an oil rig. The sludge that was coming off was a really good thing to lubricate the people who were out in the, with the sea salt. It just, gosh, that works, you know? <laughs> and so nobody thought, well, what does it do? What does it do? And it was dark, so they just made it light green. I mean, it's the kind of thing where not thinking consciously about what happens to human health, what happens with the disposal of these things, how we're recycling and upcycling these products and these chemicals and over and over. And there's not anyone saying we have to hold that responsibility. The mm -hmm. government doesn't do mm -hmm. that. That's our, that's our collective job, mm -hmm. to hold accountability for this. Mm -hmm. And that's Otherwise. why I'm so impressed with the transparency that Seventh Generation has had from the very beginning. I mean, you know what the, what the chemicals are. Mm -hmm. You know what the, what the ingredients are. What the ingredients you can are. make a decision. Uh, as opposed to fragrance. What does that say? Right. I mean, how many potential chemicals can go into fragrance, John? I mean, literally thousands. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Of different ingredients just to make up that one word fragrance exactly. on an ingredients list. John, let's jump back to you. Um, the study shows that two out of three Americans, it's a big percentage, are concerned with potentially harmful chemicals in many of the products that they use daily. Put that into perspective to us, and would you consider this a mandate? I, I think fundamentally it is a mandate, and the good news in this study is that more and more consumers are becoming aware of what they're putting on their skin or using around their home or with their children. And Jeannie put it so well, you know, this kind of bioaccumulation uh, is occurring, uh, and it's interfering with our hormones, interrupting our hormones, leading to all sorts of um, irritation and inflammation, uh, that we have fundamentally a responsibility to rethink the formula, you know, to, to change the way we think about this from a systemic standpoint. Um, it's not just what goes into a bottle of spray cleaner that we have to be concerned about. It's about the total system impact and what happens in the environment around it and what happens over time. As we use more and more of these things, we're compounding the issue. And I think it's finally getting to a tipping point where <clears throat> it has compounded to such a degree and people are aware of the rise of asthma or autism or all these other factors in our human condition that people are waking up and saying, well, hold on a second. Mm -hmm. Exactly how do the choices I make as an everyday American, as a consumer, impact me? And as we've held at seventh generation and impact future generations. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think it's good news that people are starting to ask that question. So really the fundamental is, where do we go from here? Right. Now that that mandate is out, where do we go from here? How do we change? Uh, and how do we take that concern and turn it into real action? And you would think, okay, the mandate has been put out there, so it's time to reformulate. Is reformulation possible? It, it, absolutely. 
I mean, unequivocally, it's, it's not only realistic, uh, it's a requirement today. Mm. Uh, and you know the industry well, Sarah. You, you know in home care and personal care, there are literally thousands of companies out there today that are formulating uh, with an eye to human health, with an eye to transparency and responsibility uh, around environmental well-being. So <clears throat> the good news is that this isn't that challenging. However, the change uh, that it's going to take to take the leaders in the industry, mm -hmm. the big players, to move them, that's the hard work, right? And so really it fundamentally boils down to not a question of can we, uh, because we can. It's a question of will we? And do companies really have the will to put human health first? And I think thanks to your good work and others, you know, we saw some leadership occur in the industry recently with Johnson & Johnson. And their announcement to reformulate and to live up to their credo. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the number one thing in J&J's credo is about the care for human health and well-being. Well, they said, you know what, we've been living out of balance for too long especially when it comes to babies. So we're gonna do something about it. So I'm encouraged uh, by the large step that they've taken and the will that they've exhibited. And the question now is, will others follow? Mm -hmm. Will others have the will? And can we, as consumers, as an industry, uh, as physicians, you know, encourage that movement? Because um, we're at an inflection point now where I think we can really make some progress, um, but we've gotta push hard. Yeah. You know, I, I always call it the more you know. Once people know something, they can't forget it. Or they're very unlikely to forget something like this, something as profound, as potentially scary as this. So then people really do start asking the questions and making the demands. Jeannie, I know you were involved somewhat in, in Johnson & Johnson coming forth and saying that they are going to eliminate chemicals of concern from their products. In your opinion, are companies doing enough is Johnson & Johnson doing enough by doing that, and are other companies doing enough? I think for Johnson & Johnson, it was a long conversation to help them arrive at that, and for them to see and hear consumer demand. Um, I, you know, we'd like it to be that the, the government regulation is strong enough that the bar is set high, which it isn't. Um, and but we, mo you know, consumer demand really spoke to them because it has an impact. That, as as you said, John, their their mandate for health yeah. is it's really hard to reconcile that when there's a carcinogen in your baby shampoo. Mm -hmm. I mean, that can't be reconciled. Uh, it's a it's an important step. It's it's slower than it needs to be, and the investment that companies of multinational companies, huge companies like J and J hopefully will continue to make is into the green chemistry that they need to have, the way to formulate products, the way to think about the design and the structure and the disposal of these ingredients, these products in a way that are healthy for the environment. So it's a step, very happy about that step. It's not, it, there's, it's not enough for the people who've already been exposed and it's not enough that the rest of the industry hasn't followed suit. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but we're grateful for it. Right. Right. I don't want to be overly grateful. Though. Right. We're not, we're not fully there yet. We still have work to do. We don't want anyone to get lazy and yeah. sit back and think the work yeah. has been done. No, we're not done. Um, one more specific question on ingredients, and then Deepak, I want to come back to you and talk about a different type of ingredient and how that could solve things. But John, the study indicates that prior to participating in the questionnaire, 50% of Americans were unaware that so many products contain petroleum-based ingredients, and yet they're listed right on the package. They're right. listed as an ingredient on the package. In your experience, what does this tell us, and, and what can we do to help the consumers? Well, I, I think that um, what's pretty clear is that consumers want to protect their well-being, uh, but they're highly confused. Uh, more and more consumers are not just shopping on the front label, they're turning it around and beginning to read the ingredients, but if you've ever tried to decipher the ingredient list. You need a PhD in chemistry. I mean, it, it is so difficult to do. Um, and a lot of companies will take shortcuts and try to hide behind words like fragrance as opposed to really being transparent in their disclosure. So first, we need to be transparent in disclosure. Uh, secondly, I think, you know, the laws and regulation are outdated, right? And we're hopeful that the government will move. There's legislation. Uh, moving forward now, but in the interim, you know, 
what we need to do is have consumers be regulators uh, and make more demands of companies for transparency. Um, we've tried to take that step over the course of our history at seventh generation. Uh, Jeffrey pioneered it with trans, uh, transparency and label uh, disclosure of ingredients, not required by government, but it was the right thing to do. So how do we move forward? One of the things we've done at 7th Gen recently is we've partnered with the USDA, uh, and we're going to be the first company, as Joey referenced, uh, to share on our labels this bio-preferred seal. So consumers can come and understand by looking for that seal uh, that we are plant-based, not petroleum-based, that our products are formulated from nature, not from the synthetic uh, byproducts of, of petroleum. So uh, I think that's a positive step. I would hope that more and more people will look for the USDA bio preferred seal uh, and that other companies will join us as we try to make it easier for consumers uh, to shop and to make choices for their health and well-being uh, in the days ahead. Great. Um, Deepak, this idea of using plant-based ingredients, um, and it's, you know, it's not a pie-in-the-sky idea, it's, it's being done. Um, what does that do to enhance our well-being, or does it help to enhance our well-being? First, I want to just respond to a couple of things that have already yeah, been mentioned. I hope that after people watch this program, not only on live stream, but it will have a, hopefully a permanent life on the social networks, and we can really reach a critical mass of people in the world with this conversation because um, it's two thirds is not enough. It should be 100% of people should be concerned. Be concerned. I mean, uh, yeah, that's good when you want to select a candidate that they have a two thirds <laughs> advantage. We're talking about life, okay? We're talking about the life on our planet we're talking about interfering with hundreds of millions uh, of years of biological evolution um, with this and destroying uh, the ecosystem in a few years. Um, we are also looking at something very insane right now. You know, hundreds of billions of dollars are spent on medical research for things like cancer, um, degenerative disorders, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the fact is that those hormonal disruptions and steroidal disruptions occur because we are also interfering with uh, genetic activity. Otherwise, you wouldn't have that, you know? And our genes are also ecosystems in and of themselves. So only 5% of genetic mutations are inherited. The rest are dependent on what we call the environment, which is a silly word, because the environment is our extended body. You know, the, the more we use this word environment, we s separate ourselves, uh, when in fact the trees are our lungs. If they didn't breathe, you wouldn't breathe. Uh, this air is our breath. The, the earth recycles as our body. The waters recycle as our circulation. So we have a mindset that already separates us from nature when we are, in fact, expressions of nature. And when we say plant-based, that's the basis of life. Life started because plants, first microbes, but then plants captured the energy of the sun, turned it into life, okay? And we are now, within a few years, destroying this. The insanity of it is that we spend so much money on curing illnesses that in all probability, I would say 100% probability, uh, except for, for those 5% of genetic mutations, mm -hmm. which may be damaged to our ancestors anyway. So 100% probability that we are actually responsible for the major epidemics of our time, whether it is cardiovascular illness, uh, degenerative disorders, inflammation, cancer, autoimmune illnesses. We're not looking at the fact that despite all the research, except for a few diseases, um, there hasn't been a shift in age-adjusted mortality from cancer in the last 30 years. Shouldn't we be asking, what is the NIH up to? <clears throat> I mean, if, if we really knew this information, we should be shutting down all the medical schools 
and all the whole medical <laughs> industrial complex and we should say pay attention to what's actually happening we've become the predator on this planet we're destroying all of life and we're risking our own extinction this is a very big issue it's not just about you know how bio um, plant derived um, products is mm -hmm. going to improve our health this is a question of life on our planet right now. Mm -hmm. And we need to enhance this conversation. People need to hear about this because if they know about this, they'll, you know, <coughs> it would be insane to continue to use petrochemicals. And of course, you know, seventh generation is the pioneer in this, but I think if companies don't follow, they're gonna have to face legal problems in the future when people discover, you know, when people discover that cigarette smoking can cause lung cancer, there were lawsuits. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen mm -hmm. as people become aware of what the damage is to ourselves and to life. I really like the idea of, well, obviously that the environment is, we are in direct contact with it, connection it's with us. it. It's a part of us. We are but you're right, people look at it as this sort of foreign body and I can't really do anything to protect that or to allow it to protect me and we look at ourselves as two separate entities yeah, we but really we need to, to view ourselves as one. We making conscious choices about one. whether we value life or not. Mm -hmm. you know, Jeannie, I'd like to comment on uh, because the, the whole idea of what kind of research do we do and what do we invest in is something that is a great concern to us. <laughs> and, and in the past it's required that you conduct long-term epidemiological studies to, to really see, you know, come up with, say, what is the real risk for this exposure, one exposure to one chemical and one disease. And what gets missed in there, you can't possibly, we live in a multiple chemical environment. And, and so I think that, that need to shift the investment into prevention research, into looking at it differently, into navigating the science, into looking at what is biologically plausible. Does this chemical act this way in the laboratory? It's likely to act that way in our human bodies. We ought to take a public health stance, which would be to protect us first rather than give the chemical the free reign in, the, in our products to say, prove it's safe, rather than we have to be the human experiment and prove it's harmful. And so I think this shift is happening a little bit, at, at least at the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, which has a very small proportional budget to the rest of the NIH. But I'm yeah, with you on that. The paradigm that, shift is critical. It's great that the USDA is partnering with yes, seventh generation, that's but that's only a start. I mean, yeah. we have to shift our priorities. All the national institutes of that's health right. should be involved in this instead of wasting their uh, tax dollars and things that don't work. Yeah. And I couldn't agree more, Deepak, too. I mean, we look to physicians and NIH to help us move health forward. Uh, but at the end of the day, and that's part of why I do what I do, is that I think business uh, is one of the most powerful forces for change. I mean, we've got great power, and with that power comes responsibility to make better choices. So I think really the solution to long-term health and turning around this kind of bioaccumulation of toxins, uh, that really has to flow through business. Business has got to take the lead. Uh, we've got to make, make, make a change for human health because, as we say at Seventh Generation, we believe you can't live a healthy life on a sick planet, right? We have to see those two things as connected. Uh, and we have to be conscious of the choices we make every day uh, that safeguard the environmental and human health uh, for the next seven generations. So it's got to be led by business. It can't simply be led by the heroic efforts of great researchers and physicians. So but I would also if business add, doesn't change its business, then you go out of business. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> We're in the business of staying in business, right? Yes. It's good business to make change. But I would also argue that it's about individuals and it's about consumers finding their voice and that's why we're sitting here today and we're talking to all of you and we're also talking to the live stream audience and to as you mentioned Deepak hopefully an audience who will watch this for a long time to come it's up to every one of you to voice your concerns I mean as a mom myself I'm a mom of a two-year-old little girl right now and it's top of mind for me every single day and 
not only what she is being exposed to, but what I'm being exposed to as, as a woman who will potentially have more children, and, and how are each one of those exposures going to impact any one of us down the road? And I hear from women, I hear from moms every single day who are concerned about these things. So my, um, my little soapbox would be to just shout it from the rooftops and let your concerns be known because if the companies don't hear that this is a concern, then the companies are not going to make a change. That's why we are starting to see changes because companies are starting to hear from individuals. Ginny, uh, you said uh, a lot of companies are grandfathered in. Yeah, uh, the, 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 can't we change that if you're grandfathered well, in to kill people? <clears throat> One would hope so. <laughs> the, um, the, the Toxic Substance Control Act that Joey referred to, which was passed in the mid-70s, there were already 62,000 chemicals registered. And so the, the politics of it said, well, you're okay, we'll let you in, but the new ones will need to have a little more scrutiny. Well, clearly not that much, since only 10% of them have, have been, uh, you know, I'll give you an example. Europe has banned about 1,100 chemicals from personal care products. The FDA has banned nine. Our system doesn't allow for the robust exploration of what these chemicals do and the conscious public health positioning that says, that's not okay. So you grandfather these in, they're happy. You know, you can continue to use the chemicals that you've been using and, and there's no recourse. There's no way out of it in, the, in that system. That's why we've been trying to get the, this chemical act I don't know how many years now, it's seven, eight, nine, ten years, it gets reintroduced every year, we all work on it, working on reform of the FDA on cosmetics. The will of the people will drive it. When people say enough is enough, I don't want it anymore, right. companies say I can do it differently. When you say I can, I can formulate this without yeah. that ingredient, when you say it's making us and our planet sick, then there are people who get elected based on what the people think. And so all I can say is get out and vote. <laughs> you know, yeah, to, I mean, to, to your point, uh, you brought up the European standards, yeah. these REACH standards. Yeah. They're, they're much tighter than our own yeah. standards here in the US. And most leading US consumer goods companies formulate to the European standard in Europe, but not to the That's European right, standard in the US. They That's can right. do it but they haven't. That's right. Why haven't they? It's cheaper to formulate to our standards, and the consumers haven't demanded a change yet. Mm -hmm. That's right? right. Nor has our government. We haven't regulated. So we've got to take a step forward on all those fronts, business leadership and practicing what we call the precautionary principle, not using ingredients with suspected human health risk, not just because they're not regulated, but actually going the next step That's right. to make the right and responsible choice consumer voice, you know, and then government regulation. All three of those things need to move. And I think we have time for about one or two more questions before we get into some questions from the audience. Before I go there, though, I should have mentioned this at the beginning, but it's not too late. The hashtag, if you are tweeting about this, um, is, is it 7 Gen Deepak or 7th Gen Deepak? 7. So the number 7, T-H, G-E-N, D-E-E-P-A-K. So I hope that you'll use that so that we can all follow this, this conversation as it continues even beyond this. Um, Jeannie, in the study it showed that 60% of respondents reported that they are likely or very likely to seek out bio-based products the next time they shop for these products, products that contain bio-based ingredients. Can this sort of behavioral change have an impact on the nation's health? Absolutely. I think that that individual behavioral change drives a lot. It drives how you care for your own family, your own community. Right? Real health reform. Real, real health reform is going to take place the way we hold the values about our health. And we have to have knowledge to do that. We have to understand. I don't think three generations ago, when people were smoking in the car with their kids, and the front cover of Time Magazine had a doctor with a cigarette on it, I don't think they knew. But when knowledge comes, as, as you said, John, responsibility comes, and personal, the personal accountability for your health and the health of your family. So those behaviors do matter. They drive change in business. When you go into the doctor's office, if, or you go at the airport and you say, I don't want that x-ray. 
But when you, right? You know, when you make those decisions, when you ask your doctor something different, that they weren't prepared to, do I need a mammogram every year? Or whatever, those kinds of, that curiosity about your health and requiring others to be responsive to it, I think it does have, I think we can change behavior, I think we can. And I mean, we've seen it, the industry is, some yes. industries are changing, so. Deepak, do you want to add to that? No, ma. <laughs> she said it. You're the, you're the are, guru of changing are, behavior. Yeah, this is the important thing. A lot of people, it takes time for people mm -hmm. to change behavior, even when they know the truth, it takes time. As a physician, yes. I know that. So the first thing is to increase awareness. And actually, this is an emergency. It's not even, you know, something that we need to do over decades. We need to do this right now because it's an acute emergency. Right. It it's is. an acute sickness right. of our planet and our bodies. And we are activities of this planet. We are not nouns, we are verbs. Even our genes are verbs. And you know, this whole thing about epigenetics and genetic, genetics, even that's, it's one system, you know? know. We create these divisions. The definition of health is the return to wholeness. The word holy, the word health, the word healing, they're related. And it's time we start to think in holistic terms because all our research is based on reductionist science again. And That's it's right. actually, therefore, it's the wrong model. It doesn't That's work. Right. That's right. I love the notion that we are verbs. Yes. And, 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 and so we can change that, our activity, right? <laughs> well, and, and I go back to some of the words you said earlier. You know, we're creating a war on well-being. Yes. And if we are verbs, then we have to be the peacemakers, right? We've got to stop the war on well-being as consumers. You know, that's... I, we're going to war, and then we're trying to find a solution with war right. in our bodies. Um, Deepak, in a recent Newsweek interview, you were quoted as saying that the concept of well-being is the number one trend in the world right now. It is. Actually, I'm also a senior scientist at Gallup, and we're looking at well-being in a much bigger context. So it's physical well-being, emotional well-being, social well-being, career well-being, um, financial well-being, and uh, business well-being. They're all related. They're in, you can't do one without the other. And it is the number one trend in the world. And you can actually track conflict in a country, leadership in a country, hospital admissions in a country by looking at the well-being of its people. Uh, so at Gallup, we actually knew what was going to happen in Libya. We <laughs> knew what was going to happen in Egypt. We knew what was going to happen in Tunisia. Nobody's paying attention. If you take care of your well-being, you have contributed to the well-being of the world. Even the best way to get rid of your enemy is to enhance their capacity for well-being. I can show you the data for that, okay? So we're crazy. I mean, this is a psychotic world right now, and we take it as normal. So what is the best way that we can talk maintain about or it. enhance like we're our doing well-being? It, yeah. Enhance the conversation, reach critical mass. When people, uh, when a critical mass of people are aware of something and change their behavior, the entire world changes. And that's also, you know, there are, what do you call, early adopters, outliers, and all of that. Everybody wants, has to be an early adopter right this moment. Hmm. Final question from me, and then we'll open it up to all of you. Um, John, more than half, 54%, agree that they would like to see petroleum-free labels on the products that they shop for. Um, in effect, is the USDA bio-based seal um, this label? Is it, is it going to answer consumers' concerns? Well, I think it's certainly a step in the right direction. Um, and, you know, by putting the USDA bio-preferred label uh, out there, it invites more and more companies to make that better choice to formulate with plants, not petroleum, uh, and gives consumers an easier way to make choices for their well-being. So I think that's a good step forward in kind of removing the consumer con uh, confusion and helping those who really do want to live a, a life of well-being make better and easier choices every day. You know, we're all time-starved. We're, we're confused. You know, how do we just simplify it? Uh, so that's the step forward I think the USDA has taken. Um, and it's going to go not just across products like personal care and home care, but across all 
products that we choose. So, mm -hmm. you know, this is not just simply an issue for our, our industry and our categories that seventh generation is in, but for all industries. So hopefully it's a, it's a step forward and a broad-based step forward. Great. Let's go ahead and open it up for questions from our audience, um, also our live audience here today, but as well as our, our live stream audience who's watching from their homes and their offices. Len is going to bring the questions to us, maybe. I'll, I'll just be loud. We can hear you. The first question is uh, a live stream, uh, from the live stream, and it's a question uh, to Deepak. And the, the question is, uh, aside from buying these sorts of products, cloud-based products and the actual products, what can someone do to get into the balance um, and to purge the products from the product? Well, that's... Uh, a complicated question to get into balance requires to be in balance in all these areas of life that I mentioned, you know, social well-being. So if you have a happy friend, your happiness goes up by 50, 15%. And if your happy friend has a happy friend whom you don't know, it goes up another 10%. <laughs> okay, so one thing you can do is immediately start creating a network of happy friends. Okay, and uh, hashtag. Yeah. Make happy, be happy. Okay. Of course, uh, the, another slogan that I think that we just heard, uh, plants not petroleum. Uh, we should make that um, a, a common hashtag on Twitter. You know, I reach about five to 10 million people every day just with these ideas. But what we need to do is use our social networks much more effectively. Because once we use our social networks effectively, we're actually rewiring the planetary mind, the global brain, for a new civilization. And we need to look at every aspect of social well-being and physical well-being and financial well-being tied to that. Because in the end, it's going to be proven that your career and financial well-being also depends on this. We start, need to start thinking in these terms that you know, we can all participate, not just the four people here, but we can all participate globally in this conversation so we change the collective mindset. Mm -hmm. hmm. Another question, please. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, Dan DeClerica with Consumer Reports. First of all, thanks very much for the panel. Uh, all very interesting. I wanted to come. Uh, Talk a little bit, or ask a little bit more about the the new label. Um, this is something we look at closely, and you know, agree with you. There's a lot of confusion because there are so many labels, and so many different claims. Um, so the USDA plant preferred. First of all, how does that differ from the USDA organic label that we're starting to see on detergents? Um, and how are they both different or better than something like uh, the EPA's Design for the Environment, yeah. which seems to address toxicity, you know, more directly or directly? Great. Thanks for the question, Dan. A um, couple of things. The USDA organic standard uh, is a wonderful standard. Uh, been around a long time, and it talks about the way things are grown. In other words, you know they are organically based. Um, th what the um, uh, the bio preferred talks about is the ingredients themselves. Uh, and where they're derived from. Uh, so there's a real clear choice. Did we grow it? Is it from a plant? Or was it basically derived from petroleum? And so it measures uh, the amount of bio content, if you will, the, the, that content which comes from plants, as opposed to the way the organic standard uh, says it was developed. So at the organic standard, frankly, you can have synthetic or petroleum-based ingredients and still be certified organic. Um, because amazing. that organic, ma that matter that is plant-based was organically grown. So it's a really different shift. Uh, and it's more in line with the, the, the DFE, the design for the environment, uh, which the EPA has pushed. But this one really goes right back to, uh, it's going to be broad-based, uh, USDA certified across industries. And I think it's the first of its type, uh, different than uh, many of the labels that we have that are unique to different categories, this one will go cross-category, and therefore it will be 
an easy beacon for all consumers to see, no matter what they're buying uh, uh, for, their, for their home, for their family. Next question is also from Livestream, uh, and the question is, uh, petrochemicals-based products are cheaper. So uh, what can a lower-income family do? What can low-income families low do? Low-income families. Mm -hmm. This has certainly come up in the, um, in the canned food arena when we're mm -hmm. talking about bacino A and the lining of cans yeah. and, and the amount of canned food used. The, what we found in the personal care products was once we got 1,400 companies to, to agree to change, you started to see, not just in the salon nail polish, but the CVS and the Walgreens and, the, and the, across. So you've got a Sally Hansen and a spa version that don't have formaldehyde, dibutyl phthalate, and toluene. It becomes possible. I think, I think it's, it's, um, it's not going to happen first in the low-income sector. But it gets there if those that can make those choices with their, with their money that will drive the market. So it puts a greater responsibility, I think, on those that can afford it to help drive the market and the prices go down. You, you remember you couldn't, get, you couldn't get organic and Safeway 10 years ago or process chlorine free copy paper at, at Office Depot. So these things have shifted in part because people that could, individuals that had the capacity, made that investment. So I think it, it's, it's incumbent on those of us who can to invest for those who will, who will be lifted by our work. I would also, if I may, add to that from just a very practical standpoint because I hear from a lot of people around the country every day and, and uh, affordability is top of mind for so many people. And the other idea of when it matters, as, as you know, as this person who wrote in this question knows that it matters, when it matters, vote, you know, vote with your dollars. Every time we make a purchase, we are, we are casting a vote for that company, the people who made that product. So maybe buy less products. You don't need 15 different cleaning products to do a few jobs. Buy those three or four cleaning products that are the quality ones that are going to matter, that will not do harm to the body, and save your money other places. And it costs a lot more to treat cancer. Yeah, on exactly, all these than to avoid the hospital run, in the first right. place. It's going to cost a lot more to treat these yeah. illnesses. What you said, I don't know if everybody caught that, uh, but you can have something organic and still have petroleum in it. Yeah. I think people have to realize that. That's a very important point. Do we have another question? I think we have some uh, shy folks in the audience here. Uh, another question uh, comes in. This one's for John. And the question is, um, what will seventh generation do? Now that you have this study, is there any plans? I know it just came out today. So, <laughs> but uh, are there any plans to uh, to use it to educate consumers um, or you know otherwise let people know? Yeah, and, and this is a great first step. Obviously, we wanted to get a forum together, uh, some influential leaders. Deepak has global reach. I mean, just get the message out is the first step. Secondly, we've invited all of you in the audience, um, and and once you have knowledge, you have responsibility, right? So back to all of you. What will you do with this information? How will we change the dialogue together? Um, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. So we have a responsibility, all of us, to talk, to raise awareness, to continue uh, to make this movement come alive. Uh, and we at Seventh Generation will continue to use our social media outreach, our million Facebook fans to, to engage the conversation, uh, to continue to partner and encourage others in the USDA uh, to join the USDA. Uh, we will make this uh, a centerpiece of what we're uh, going to celebrate in the year ahead, our 25th anniversary. So this is the beginning of a dialogue for us, uh, certainly not the end. Hi, my name is Meredith Turretz. I'm from Glamour. I'm the health editor there on the website. Um, I'm just curious if you see a difference between uh, the way men and women react um, uh, physiologically to the chemicals that are um, harmful within these products, um, you know, whether they are uh, more harmful to women, um, you know, while they're kind of in 
early stages in their bodies, later on, um, you know, whether their replacement chemicals have been more uh, beneficial, you know, uh, to the replacements, you know, have been more beneficial to women, to men, whether there's any difference at all, um, you know, or if it's going to just okay, across the board of uh, better solutions <coughs> for both men and women. Deepak and I are gonna, gonna both uh, adjust this. I think one of the things that I, I referenced before just a little bit was, was the, the timing of exposure. So um, there's tremendous impact on the developing fetus in utero, both on the male and the female um, uh, during that period, early life. Any time that there's rapid cell development, which is growth time, so that's you know, in utero, early childhood, just before puberty, puberty, when a woman is lactating, there's tremendous vulnerability. The cells are very vulnerable during that time. And, and a woman's body has a unique response to chemicals that act like hormones. A unique response. That doesn't mean there isn't a response in the male body to hormones um, as well. I mean, we are seeing an increase in testicular cancer in young men. And we're seeing this, that, that are, there's a corollary between that and, and maybe Deepak can expand on that. So if you wind up having these, these exposures at a critical window, and it doesn't matter if it's a big dose, it can be a low dose, it can be multiple chemicals at not great doses, over time can have an incredible impact on later life health. So yes, I mean, a woman's body does react different because of her, um, because just of, you know, that we're hormonally different. By the way, I'm, I'm a hormone specialist. My training is oh, in well, you endocrinology. Let me go first. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> My training was in endocrinology, but no, you're right. But here's the point, actually. It's much more obvious in women yeah. because of the menstrual cycle <clears throat> and infertility that can occur, not only damage to the fetus. So it's much more obvious in women um, than in men, but I'm sure that men also yeah. have these problems. It doesn't become so easily apparent. Thank you. And we have time for maybe one more question. Um, my name is Sheila Hollander, and just to follow up on that, um, this is for Jeannie Rizzo. In your work as the uh, CEO of the Breast Cancer Fund, I know that you have uh, studied the rates of cancer that have doubled over since 19, the 1940s. And there's a recent book that came out by Florence Williams by the name of Breasts. And um, this woman had her breast milk uh, checked to see what kind of chemicals were found in there. And I don't want to horrify everyone, but there were some very bad chemicals in there. Can you ex speak to how women's bodies and men's at this point, because men have breast cancer just as well as women do, how these are absorbed in the body? There are certain chemicals that are, are what we call lipophilic. They're fat-seeking. And they seek, the, they seek fat, they wind up being held in breast tissue. So the target organ for breast cancer is, is loaded with chemicals that seek fat. They, and so what happens when we've tested breast milk, especially before a woman's first lactation, the very first milk before her first full lactation, and found hundreds of toxic chemicals in there. And in Sweden, when they found, for example, flame retardants in women's breast milk, they banned the flame retardants. It was a pretty simple thing to do. We don't want flame retardants in breast milk. Now that said, breast milk is still best, but we want to be sure it's pure and it's protected. So the breast is a signal. What's going on with women's breasts in this country and around the world are a signal to what is wrong. I mean, if we just pay attention to that, you know, what's going on with women's breasts will understand what we're doing wrong about the planet and about our health. It's the adipose tissue, the fat tissue. It's very metabolically active, actually. And I am sure, based on what we know about metabolism and fat tissues, that this is a contribution to the epidemic of obesity, yes. type 2 diabetes, which is linked to almost every disease. It's the number one epidemic today in our 
uh, civilization. And the more fat you're holding, the more that you're recycling and upcycling those chemicals back into your body. So it's a vicious, vicious cycle. I think so. I want to say thank you to our live stream audience. In case we, we lose our window and, and we lose the people who are watching at home, I do want to thank you for joining us and today. Spread the message on Twitter, Facebook, That's right. Google+, Plus, everywhere. Everywhere you possibly can because it's up to every single one of you to help keep this conversation alive. So thank you to all of you joining. Um, and we will take one more question from the audience. My name is uh, David Fox. My wife and I are shareholders of second generation in the 90s. I did so PBS Plus specials with the Scott Chopper. I feel that the issue is a little abstract. Thousands of chemicals, dozens of products. <clears throat> Ronald Reagan, may he rest in peace, was not my hero. But what he did at the State of the Union uh, speeches that he gave is he personified abstract issues with one individual. I think that we need to come away from this with specific individuals that have been harmed that can be held up as examples to break through the abstraction of this issue. I'm wondering, are there test cases, people that we can point to that we can personify as symbols of this issue rather than leave it as abstractions to thousands of companies? I think we need to do that. Uh, absolutely right. I mean, if we start looking, we'll start to find these people. <clears throat> and that should be a priority. Yeah. And I think we can hold up uh, industry as well, companies specifically. So we talked a little bit about J&J and, and their choice. I think that is making concrete uh, the fact that we can make a movement within business. Uh, we need to look uh, across specific chemicals uh, and talk about those specific individuals specific businesses, because I think this is a multifaceted problem uh, that's going to need a very complex solution uh, to reverse the tide of all the years of bioaccumulation that we carry around in our planet and in our personal beings. And I think to you, to the, I mean, I feel working in breast cancer where one in eight women will have breast cancer in her lifetime. And then you look at, for example, a personification of chemicals and disease that Camp Lejeune, have you heard about the male breast cancer at the yes. military base? And you have 80 men, and they all were at the military base exposed to toxic solvents. That's a dramatic personification. The challenge that we have with is there are so many diseases linked and so many contributing factors from different chemicals that a woman with breast cancer will say, I know it's it's the exposures that I had over a lifetime, but I can't point to that exposure and that disease. Now, the, I think it's why the Camp Lejeune conversation about the male breast cancer so dramatically personifies it, because men don't get breast cancer that way, not 80 all in the same place. I mean, there are 1,500 a year in the entire country. So to have, <clears throat> but it's a, difficult, uh, it's a difficult challenge to make one face of hunger or of disease that is associated, so. Yeah, don't men don't have the same amount of adipose tissue right. you know, that women have, but they have other kinds of cancer. Right. Uh, you mentioned testicular cancer. Right. But the point is well taken. You know, if you have dramatic examples personified, people will react emotionally much mm -hmm. faster than with all this information, so that needs to be done. Thank you for your questions. And John, Jeannie, Deepak, thank you so much you. for, you, for giving your time, you for, your time. Um, for this thank today. Thank you all for joining us, both, both in audience and also watching from home in audiences. And, and we, on behalf of this panel, ask you to just continue this conversation. If you are tweeting, the hashtag is 7th Gen Deepak. And if we can keep the conversation going, then we can demand more change. And that is really what I believe we all believe needs to happen. So thank you.